Suppose you have a unitary representation of this group. We may write, depending on the way we describe group elements, either d of u or d of alpha for the unitary operators which represent different group elements. So, these operators must obey the group multiplication rules or if for example if we write it in axis angle variables it the d's must compose according to this formula this is the infinitesimal form of the composition rule so the definition of the generators of a representation, their commutation relations, they are very similar to what we saw in the case of SO3. So we define the generators of any SU2 representation to be the derivatives of the operators capital D at the origin. So this means that the generators are the first terms in a Taylor series expansion of these operators and it's a very simple nice exercise from this form of the group composition rule you can easily convince yourselves that these generators whatever the representation may be will obey these commutation relations. So what it means is that the two groups SO3 three dimensional rotations and SU2 two dimensional unitary transformations with unit determinant they have the same structure constants. And that is a reflection of the fact that locally near the identity they are isomorphic. In the defining representation of SU2 which is 2 by 2 the Pauli matrices are the generators apart from a factor of half. And it's also true that this definition of the generators, this can be integrated and for any finite group element, the operators representing it are always expressible as single exponentials with the alphas in the exponent and the generators. It is a result of the general theory that in the case of SU2 every representation, every unitary representation of this group is obtained by finding some Hermitian set of operators obeying these commutation relations and then exponentiating them. So the problem of constructing representations of SU2 has been totally reduced to the problem of solving these commutation relations. The most important thing is that once you obey the commutation relations, you do not have to impose any additional conditions. Just go exponentiate. Now you can ask, uh, and the reason for this is that SU2 is simply connected. Now you can ask, how does conjugation appear in a general representation. J are capital J are the generators and you apply U on the left and U inverse on the right and it is a straightforward matter to show that what happens is what I am writing here. This is the transpose of A of U or it means by looking let us say at the linear terms in the expansion of the exponent the generators or in any representation the generators under conjugation by finite group elements will transform in this way. 
So we say that by definition this equation tells us what is the adjoint representation of SU2. Adjoint representation of SU2 is the transformation rule for the generators of SU2 representation whatever the representation may be. What this tells us is that the adjoint representation of SU2 equals defining representation of SO3. In the case of SO3 defining and adjoint were the same. In the case of SU2 they are not the same. And why is it that they have a common adjoint representation? It is because they have the same structure constants. Commutation relations are the same. That is why the adjoint representations are the same. So with this background, let us look at the irreducible unitary representations of SU2. All we have to do, as I have just described, is find all irreducible representations of these commutation relations by Hermitian operators and include all of them. Don't discard any solutions. So this is something which you study, will study or have studied in quantum angular momentum theory. And I just recall the results very briefly. For every integral or half odd integral value of j, there is one irreducible Hermitian solution. One solution like, uh, for each j. In the space of the solution, the vector space of the solution, we can introduce a basis, an orthonormal basis, labeled in this way, where this magnetic quantum number takes these values. In integer steps, j, j minus 1 down to minus j. So, the thing that you can easily recognize is that if j is integer, this spectrum of m includes 0. If j is half odd integer, it does not include 0. It has only plus minus half, plus minus 3 by 2 up to some point. And <coughs> the formulae for the actions of the various generators are the same as we found for SO3 except that now half integral values of j have to be included. So let me just write them. I omit the equation which says that these vectors are an orthonormal basis that is understood. In writing these e equations, one has to make a certain convention for the phase factors associated with the basis vectors. So this is the standard phase convention uh, which is used in quantum mechanics in angular momentum theory in general. And again, as we saw in the case of SO3, the, in the standard basis, J3 has a diagonal matrix, real diagonal matrix. J1 is real symmetric. J2 is pure imaginary antisymmetric. So all of them are of course Hermitian. Now the fact that the eigenvalues of the generator J3 have this structure, this is a spectrum of J3, it tells us, as we saw in the case of SO3, something about how the SU2 representation um, breaks up under restriction to a subgroup. So one can write it in the following way. The unitary irreducible representation J of SU2 under, under restriction to the U1 subgroup, let us say, third axis. And you remember, uh, we have written down uh, the 2 by 2 matrices corresponding to this subgroup. They are diagonal ones, 
with the mutually complex conjugate phases on the diagonal. So you take an irreducible SU2 representation, limit yourself to this subgroup of diagonal matrices and you ask what representations of this subgroup do you get? Of course it is not irreducible, it is a direct sum of one dimensional representations labeled by magnetic quantum number. You can say that this is how the irreducible SU2 representation splits or breaks up into irreducible one dimensional pieces with respect to the subgroup. So this has a number in my notes and from here you can immediately read off a formula for the character of SU2 irreducible representations. Again go back to yesterday we have seen that every equivalence class in SU2 has a representative element from this subgroup. So you can exploit that fact and then here is the formula for the character of the jth irreducible representation. I will write it first in a form where you immediately appreciate the structure. It is just one term from each component of this reduction and this can now be, it is a geometric series. can be easily add, uh, summed and this is the result and remember in listing all the classes of SU2 we have to allow the angle alpha to go over the range 0 up to 2 pi. So let me rub off some equations. So this is the result for the character. So these characters, uh, uh, the main difference again compared to SO3 is that the values J equal to half, 3 by 2, 5 by 2, they also have to be taken into account. That is the, so roughly speaking SU2 has double the number of irreducible representations that SO3 had. In both have infinitely many, this has a double infinity. And if you remember the expression for the invariant integration over SU2, you restrict yourself to what we call class functions functions which are constant over each equivalence class, put in the characters, they form a orthonormal set of functions. This is only one variable alpha, the three dimensional integration over SU2 has become simplified to a one dimensional integral because we are dealing with class functions. And if you have any class function, any function of alpha where alpha runs from 0 to 2 pi, it can be uniquely expanded this is the completeness of the characters and what are the values of j 0, half, 1 all the way up to infinity uniquely it can be expanded in terms of the characters and the scalar product of the function with itself is sum of the squared moduli of all the expansion coefficients. So this is the, what was the formula? Plancherel formula. <laughs> so these are things which uh, I would like you to convince yourself by starting with the normal Fourier series which you may be familiar with for functions of an angle from 0 to 2 pi and massage it, manipulate it to also prove that any function over the circle over alpha over 0 to 2 pi can also be expanded in terms of these functions. The only thing is this is the weight function for the scalar product. Sin squared alpha by 2 is there as part of the volume element. 
so this is for um, class functions the properties of characters of irreducible representations again I remind you in the case of SO3 for class functions we had functions of an angle alpha only going over the range 0 up to pi now it has become double again and in a reflection of the fact that SU2 is a two-fold covering of SO3 well I will be very brief about the D matrices and their completeness and orthogonality properties again structures are exactly like SO3 except include half integer J values what do these matrices look like well the best thing you should you can do to make the cal expressions as simple as possible is to use Euler angles so I would tell my mathematical friends <laughs> for practical calculations you have to choose some coordinate system and here we go and so these are uh, called the SU2 D functions that's a definition that's a notation and you see again the dependence on two of the three angles becomes very simple and the only non-trivial part is the D function little d function uh, which by the way is a real orthogonal matrix again even for the j equal to half integer case because we have seen j2 that generator is pure imaginary anti-symmetric what is this matrix well I don't have to remind you it is this matrix element of a finite rotation around the z-axis so let me try to save a little time and just say that if you had a function over the entire SU2 group not just a class function but a function which takes different values at different points of the group every such square integrable function can be uniquely expanded as an infinite linear combination a series in the D functions these are not normalized they are mutually orthogonal if you take two of these functions if their J values differ their inner product is zero if the row indices differ zero column indices differ zero if all of them coincide the um, norm of this function is 1 by 2 J plus 1 1 over the dimensionality so you have to absorb that dimensionality factor into the D function to make it into a normalized function any case any function square integrable function on the group SU2 can be uniquely expanded as an infinite linear combination of all the D functions yeah two 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 j2 i'm sorry j2 j2 good now it should not be z j2 now supposing your function on the group su2 happens to have the same value at pairs of points which are mapped into the same SO3 function or SO3 element a function on the group SU2 which has this property certainly you can consider such functions these are really functions on SO3 but masquerading as functions on SU2 so this is a, just a very nice uh, thing to just keep in mind what you have is a mapping from SU2 onto SO3 and it is a 2 to 1 mapping 
and all of SO3 is covered. So we call it an onto mapping. In such a situation, given any function on SO3, from it you can create a function on SU2. You understand this? See the mapping, so I should draw a picture. What you have is a well defined mapping in this direction. Pairs of points in SU2 share common points as images in SO3. So this mapping is well defined in this direction. It is not well defined, it is not defined in the reverse direction. But given this mapping that it is well defined here, any function on SO3 can be regarded as a particular simple function on SU2. Namely, it is a function on SU2 which has the same value at pairs of points which have a common image. Functions on SO3 can be re regarded as such functions on SU2. Okay, so this is generally true and in differential geometry this uh, idea is called the pullback operation. If a mapping works in one way, functions on the right can be pulled back to give functions on the left but you won't get the most general function on the left. You'll get special, particular function. So, if you now take the general SU2 expansion of a function in terms of all the D functions of SU2, it will have J equal to 0, half, 1, 3 by 2, everything. If you now say, my function has this symmetry property, it has the same value at an element u of SU2 and it is negative. What happens in that infinite uh, uh, series? The 0, a half, 3 by 2 terms just vanish and you recover the ordinary SO3 uh, expansion. Okay? So that is what is uh, involved. And in the process, the range of one of the variables gets cut by half. Okay, so these are things which I go into in some detail because uh, they are, they can be the sources of some amount of confusion. Yeah. Yeah. Symmetric around the zero. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't follow. The function See, this U is a two by two matrix. Oh, for class functions. Ah, yeah, I guess so. The only thing is. We generally like to use the parameter value 0 for the identity element. So, it is awkward to make the range of alpha uh, minus something to plus something. It's awkward. Nothing sacrosanct about this, but we have all got, got, con, uh, got used to this. <laughs> in this context, I should say, one should always keep in mind, uh, keep a clear idea, what is a convention, what is an unavoidable necessity. <laughs> this is very important. I have a very distinguished, very senior uh, physicist friend who was a couple of years senior to me and uh, he, even in late in life, he thought that only the Z component of spin can be measured. <laughs> because you always say, let us work in a basis where the Z component of angular momentum is diagonal. So, he thought that is the only thing that can be measured experimentally. So it took a lot of convincing that you can decide to measure x component, y component if you wish. You know. So it is just a convention about uh, what kind of basis you use. So I want to develop a small table which is quite uh, instructive. This is a table where I uh, just list the key features of the two, so you see some differences also. So, first, 
I write the J value. Next, I give the dimension of the representation, 2J plus 1. Then, what SU2 representation are we dealing with? What SO3 representation are we dealing with? Question of reality and any other remarks. If you have J equal to 0, dimensionality is 1. Are we dealing with an SU2 representation? Yes. It is a trivial representation. Are we dealing with an SO3? Yes. It is trivial. Is it real? Yes, it is real. What remark do I make? Well, let me just leave it blank for the moment. Next you come to the value j equal to half. Dimension 2. Is it an SU2 representation? Yes. It is a defining representation. Is it an SO3 representation? Answer? <laughs> no. So, the reason why I am drawing up this table is to make it 100% clear in your mind when are you talking of an SO3 representation, when are you talking of an SU2 and so on. Reality we say it is pseudo real. What does it mean? It means here is an SU2 representation. If you take the complex conjugate of this representation, it is equivalent to the original. That means the complex conjugate matrices are all obtained from the original matrices by some fixed unitary matrix, conjugation, S something S inverse. D star equals S D S inverse. But whatever you do, however you choose, choose the basis, the matrices cannot be made real. So they are equivalent to the complex conjugates, but they cannot be brought to real form. So it means that here is a case where you have a um, character which is real, representation is pseudo real. And here I will just make the comment. I want to add a remark here. I don't put any remark for the first one because it's a trivial representation. Now let us go to J equals 1, dimension 3. Is it an SU2 representation? What are all the interesting things you can say? Oh, I should also say, uh, I add two more things here. Because this is the defining representation, it is faithful and it is called a spinner. This is the first time I am introducing this word to you. Objects belonging to this representation of SU2 are called two component spinners. What are the things we can say about the spin 1 representation? It is the adjoint representation of SU2. It is a representation. It is called the adjoint representation and it is not faithful. The little matrix U and the matrix minus U cannot be distinguished from each other in this representation. Is it an SO3 representation? Yes, it is a defining representation defining. Is it real? Yes. It is explicitly real. It is given by, re I mean, in quantum angular momentum theory, uh, in a J3 basis, the matrices are not real, but they can be made real, as we saw, is by our Cartesian tensors. And here, a 2 pi rotation is represented by the trivial transformation. Next we have j equal to 3 by 2, dimension 4. It is an SU2 representation. The only interesting comment I would like to make is that it is a faithful representation. 
it is not a representation of SO3. What about its reality property? It is pseudo real. And how is a 2 pi rotation represented? It is represented by minus 1. And so on. The next would be j equal to 2, dimension 5, non faithful, yes, real, plus 1. Okay. So, and so this table goes on. So, as I remarked yesterday, SU2 is the only Lie group which has one and only one irreducible representation in every dimension. No other group has this property. And that as a result, I and my impression is that uh, this group, SU2, is exploited in many ways in uh, mathematics, but I don't know too much more about it. I just point it out. <coughs> One, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> yes, we should put it. And of course, by definition, it is uh, faithful. It is faithful. Also. Now, here is a minor comment. In every one of these representations, well, each of these acts in a certain vector space, complex vector space, let us say, of certain dimension, of dimension 2j plus 1. In every one of them, the representation preserves a certain bilinear form. That is, supposing I just indicate for the moment by psi a vector a wave function with 2j plus 1 complex components in any one of these representations. And I did, and I also denote by phi another. Unfortunately, these are the same as the Euler angles, but you know the context. So, whichever j representation I choose, I have a 2j plus 1 component complex quantity with component psi m or phi m, m means the magnetic quantum number. In every case, so psi and phi are examples of vectors in the vector space. Under an element of SU2, they transform both in the same way. It is always true that one can write a bilinear expression with the property that it is invariant. And there is a standard form for it. I will just write it for you. With the standard choices of uh, phases and so on, this expression is unchanged if you apply the same SU2 representation matrix to psi and to phi. So, this is called an invariant bilinear form. You know it very well in the case of spin 1, angular momentum 1 or the defining representation. It is just in the real form the dot product of two vectors in three dimensional space. It is just that. But such a thing, an invariant bilinear form is present in each irreducible representation. Correct. So, this is called, well, I, well, it's a phrase, uh, I'll just say it, I will not explain it. When you study quantum theory of angular momentum, then you will understand. This is called a zero coupled pair. That is, it is describing in the sense of quantum mechanics, two particles each having the spin j and the combined state is invariant. It has spin 0. It is rotationally invariant. So, it is called a zero coupled pair. The interesting thing is that 
in all the integer cases 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., this expression is symmetric under interchange of psi and phi, like a dot b, and that is true in all dimensions. For all half integer, half odd integer, 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves, and so on, this bilinear form is anti symmetric. And as he said, for spin half, one knows the total spin equal to 0 is anti symmetric in the two spin halves. And that is true for any higher uh, half integer spin, 3 by 2, 5 by 2, etc. So I mentioned this just for a very simple reason that uh, many years ago, uh, Professor Sudarshan uh, wrote a paper in Proceedings of Indian Academy of Sciences. This must have been uh, in 1967 or 68, where he argued that one can give a proof of the spin statistics theorem of elementary of particle physics or quantum field theory without using any properties of special relativity and using only this distinguishing feature of the integer spin versus half integer spin. So he, that was his uh, idea. As you probably know, the very first uh, proof, a proof of this spin statistics theorem that integer spin particles are bosons and half odd integer are fermions was given by Pauli in the year uh, 1940 in reviews of modern physics. And in that paper at the end he says, in conclusion, we state our opinion that uh, we state that in our opinion, this connection between spin and statistics is one of the most important consequences of special relativity theory. That was a statement in uh, Pauli's end of the Pauli's paper. Sudarshan's idea was there is no need for relativity to show the connection. It is just the consequence of three-dimensional space being three-dimensional, space being three-dimensional and this distinction between uh, the bilinear form being symmetric for integer spin and anti-symmetric for half integer spin. So he gave an argument along these lines um, and he used this so-called Schwinger action principle to give the proof. So this uh, has remained a continuing interest of his ever since and it was one of the seven quests. <laughs> quests. And I think there is a book also by uh, Sudarshan and Duff. Duke, I think. Not Duke. Duff. Yeah, Duff. Duff. That's Swin Statistics book by Duff. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Is that right? Then yeah, yeah. But what is the co-author's name? Duke. 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 Oh. Oh. Duck. Duck. <laughs> duck. Ah, not Duke. Ah, I said Duff. I should have said Duck. <laughs> okay, okay. It is Duck. Yeah. Duck. Yeah. Okay. It's very nice. It's a nice coincidence you have it in your bag. Do you sleep with it under your pillow? <laughs> huh? Beside. Okay. Under the pillow you will get a cricked neck. Now I want to introduce very briefly the concept of multi-spin spinors with respect to SU2 just as a kind of uh, cousin brother to Cartesian tensors in the case of SO3. It is very similar in spirit. I will use Greek indices, alpha, beta and so on, to go over two values, 1 and 2. These are going to be the labels for the components of a two-component spinner. What is a two-component spinner? Something which transforms according to the defining representation of SU2. So, now we say a rank J SU2 multispinner. We define, we invent such an object. We say it is a collection of 
complex quantities which I write in this way. Sorry, oh, I made some mistake. What am I? I think there are some errors in my. Uh, I have written here rank 2j. Why I don't remember now? Oh, yeah, j cannot be half integer. <laughs> you can't have a half, you can, can't have a rank half <laughs> multi spin one. For, see, j goes over the values 0, half, 1, 3 by 2, 2, and so on. So, 2j is always an integer. So, I am not as uh, careless as I momentarily thought. <laughs> a multi spinor of rank 2j is a collection of, comp let us say for simplicity, complex amplitudes or numbers, psi alpha 1, alpha 2, up to alpha 2j, where every one of the indices goes over the two values 1 and 2, like a two component spinner, and the transformation rule under an element of SU2 is the following. So, it is obvious that this is a consistent definition. You can apply SU2 elements one after the other, they will compose properly because you are just using the matrices of the defining representation again and again. So, this is the definition of an SU2 multi spinner, and this is to be thought of as the analog for SU2 of Cartesian tensors for SO3. But there are naturally important differences. How many components are there in general? for a multi spinor of rank 2j huh? pardon i can't hear you 4 j squared why yeah and how many indices yeah 2 power 2 to the power 2j that's the number of components of a general rank 2j multi spinner. Now we do the same game, play the same game as we did with Cartesian tensors. Since it is the same matrix appearing again and again, if this original psi had any kind of symmetry property under permutations of its subscripts, that symmetry property would be preserved. Psi prime would enjoy the same properties as psi. So now we will say the following. Suppose you imagine that the original components are completely symmetric under all permutations of the indices. Then since it is the same u again and again, this is also completely symmetric. So, Symmetric multi spinors remain symmetric multi spinors. Now the counting is extremely simple. How many components does a symmetric multi spinor have? But see, every index has only how many values? One or two? So the value of psi is completely determined if I tell you how many of these indices have the value one, the rest must all be two. There is not even a 1, 2 and 3 as we had in SO3. So, for a symmetric multi spinner, how many inde algebraically independent components are there? You just have to say how many of the indices could be 1 and in how many ways can I choose the value 1? The balance will have to be 2. Tell me, what is the number of components, independent components? Huh? No. <laughs> How many of the 
component betas or alphas could take the value 1 how many could take the value 1 maybe none of them takes the value 1 all of them are 2 maybe one of them takes the value 1 the rest are 2 and what's the end all of them are 1 2j plus 1 so once you have a symmetric multispinor the number of independent algebraically independent components is 2j plus 1. There is no need to remove traces. You already have hit rock bottom. These are the irreducible representations of SU2. So elementary. Okay. Now this idea, oh, one uh, passing remark that I have heard from Sudarshan many, many times that uh, Schwinger in all his work he loved this multi-spinner idea and in the context of uh, Lorentz group four component spinners so everything he would write as far as possible in the language of multi-spinners so I think that is why Sudarshan also liked it very much now this fact that a symmetric multi-spinner is already irreducible that it transforms according to an irreducible representation of SU. That is at the heart of a very important construction which I will now describe and this is used in so many ways. But I will just give you the group theoretical construction. There are three names associated with this uh, uh, construction and I will give you all of them. Weil, Jordan, and Schwinger. So this is a way to very simply build up all the irreducible representations of SU2. First I will give it in the original Weil form and then in the Jordan-Schwinger form because that uses the mathematical machinery of quantum mechanics. So what we say is suppose you have a matrix in the defining representation of SU2 and you imagine a two component complex column vector with components psi and eta which transforms by this rule under an SU3, SU2 transformation. So this is a linear homogeneous transformation. Now I think even the notation is exactly as it is in uh, Herman Weil's book Group the Theory of Groups and Quantum Mechanics. Then the statement is the following. Now you take any j value 0, half, 1, 3 by 2 any j you like and consider the monomials psi to the j plus m eta to the j minus m over square root of j plus m factorial j minus m factorial you keep j fixed and you give for m all the standard values j, j minus 1, j minus 2 up to minus j. How many monomials do you have? <laughs> 2j plus 1, that's the number of m values. So I can write here 2j plus 1 monomials. Now, supposing you make psi and eta transform to psi prime and eta prime by this 2 by 2 defining matrix from the SU2. What will happen to these monomials? This is linear homogeneous. These monomials since j is fixed have total degree 2j. Just the m keeps changing from one monomial to the next. By homogeneity psi prime j plus m eta prime j minus m over this 
numerical factor must be must be a certain linear combination of the similar monomials formed out of psi and eta right because 2j total order cannot change the homogeneous transformation all that can happen is that some coefficients will appear here and what will they depend upon hmm? u this u2 well <laughs> we are home Simon, is it M prime M or M M prime? I have to <laughs> check my notes. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, if you don't mind, for the on the board it is much simpler. Let us have primes everywhere together, and no primes together. This is the formula. So, this this is the Hermann Weyl construction. It tells you these are the d functions of SU2. <laughs> so elementary. We have not used the uh, machinery of quantum theory of angular momentum. We have got the d matrices directly. Because it works very simply because SU2 is such a nice little group. So what is the range of uh, m? It is minus j to plus j in uh, unit steps. So this is a wild construction and it says that you get all the representations of SU2, all the irreducible representations are obtained by this construction. This same idea has been expressed in an operator language by Jordan and Schwinger and the uh, original the paper of Schwinger it is not published paper it is called an uh, NYO report it's a report written for the US Atomic Energy Commission when in the 1950s or something it is reprinted in many places uh, one of them Schwinger's collected works published by uh, World Scientific, it is called, it's called, I think the, or the title of the collection is a quantum legacy. This is a collection of a few of the important articles of Schwinger published by World Scientific and I think this angular momentum, uh, this report, this long paper of his is included there. And the title of this uh, manuscript by Schwinger is just I think on angular momentum that's if I remember. So the idea is actually very elegant and this is used by many people in a variety of contexts. I want to emphasize it is really this construction which is purely a C number construction no operators no ket vectors nothing of the kind but they have expressed it in this operator language which is convenient for various purposes. What you do is you introduce two independent harmonic oscillators, label them as A1 and A2 and impose the standard commutation relations among A's and A daggers. So this is equation 99. I am close to hitting a century unless you bowl me out at this point. <laughs> so you have to think of the two annihilation operators as arranged in a column vector and then the natural notation would be to say a dagger stands for the two creation operators arranged in a row vector. So 
in this jordan schwinger construction it is based on the quantum mechanics of two independent harmonic oscillators and now what do you do what you do is out of this a's and a daggers you define j1 j2 and j3 as operators these are equal to 1 half a dagger pauli matrix a. this is the called the schwinger construction or jordan schwinger construction i have not read the uh, jordan's original paper i have read uh, it's not accessible uh, maybe may in german i don't know the schwinger one as i said is reprinted in more than one place what you now find is the following you start with these harmonic oscillator commutation relations the j's are bilinear 1a and 1a dagger for example what is j3 the component is uh, which is the only one that can be measured <laughs> what is j3 in this construction one half one fifth full representation it is not a representation of so3 what about its reality property it is pseudo real and how is a 2 pi rotation represented it is represented by minus 1 and so on the next would be j equal to 2 dimension 5 non faithful yes real plus 1 okay so and so this table goes on so as i remarked yesterday su2 is the only lie group which has one and only one irreducible representation in every dimension no other group has this property and that as a result i and my impression is that this group su2 is exploited in many ways in uh, mathematics but i don't know too much more about it i just point it out <coughs> one yeah yeah ha huh. yeah yeah correct <laughs> yes we should put it and of course by definition it is uh, faithful it is faithful also. now here is a minor comment in every one of these representations well each of these acts in a certain vector space complex vector space let us say of certain dimension of dimension 2j plus 1 in every one of them the representation preserves a certain bilinear form that is supposing i just indicate for the moment by psi a vector a wave function with 2j plus 1 complex components in any one of these representations and i did and i also did not by phi another unfortunately these are the same as the euler angles but you know the context so whichever j representation i choose i have a 2j plus 1 component complex quantity with component psi m or phi m m means the magnetic quantum number in every case so psi and phi are examples of vectors in the vector space under an element of su2 they transform both in the same way it is always true that one can write a bilinear expression with the property that it is invariant and there is a standard form for it i will just write it for you with the standard choices of 
phases and so on this expression is unchanged if you apply the same SU2 representation matrix to psi and to phi. So this is called an invariant bilinear form. You know it very well in the case of spin 1, angular momentum 1 or the defining representation. It is just in the real form the dot product of two vectors in three dimensional space. It is just that. But such a thing, an invariant bilinear form is present in each irreducible representation. Correct. So, this is called, well, I, well, it's a phrase, uh, I'll just say it, I will not explain it. When you study quantum theory of angular momentum, then you will understand. This is called a zero coupled pair. That is, it is describing in the sense of quantum mechanics, two particles each having the spin j and the combined state is invariant. It has spin zero. It is rotationally invariant. So it is called a zero coupled pair. The interesting thing is that in all the integer cases, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. This expression is symmetric under interchange of psi and phi. Like A dot B. And that is true in all dimensions. For all half integer, half odd integer, 1 half, 3 halves, 5 halves and so on, this bilinear form is anti-symmetric. And as he said, for spin half one knows, the total spin equal to 0 is anti-symmetric in the two spin halves. And that is true for any higher uh, half integer spin, 3 by 2, 5 by 2, etc. So I mention this just for a very simple reason that uh, many years ago, uh, Professor Sudarshan uh, wrote a paper in Proceedings of Indian Academy of Sciences. This must have been uh, in 1967 or 68 where he argued that one can give a proof of the spin statistics theorem of elementary of particle physics or quantum field theory without using any properties of special relativity and using only this distinguishing feature of the integer spin versus half integer spin. So he, that was his uh, idea. As you probably know, the very first uh, proof a proof of this spin statistics theorem that integer spin particles are bosons and half odd integer are fermions was given by Pauli in the year 1940 in Reviews of Modern Physics. And in that paper at the end he says, in conclusion we state our opinion that, uh, we state that in our opinion this connection between spin and statistics is one of the most important consequences of special relativity theory. That was a statement in uh, Pauli's, end of the Pauli's paper. Sudarshan's idea was there is no need for relativity to show the connection. It is just the consequence of three-dimensional space being three-dimensional, space being three-dimensional and this distinction between of uh, the bilinear form being symmetric for integer spin and anti-symmetric for half integer spin. So he gave an argument along these lines um, and he used this so-called Schwinger action principle to give the proof. So this uh, has remained a continuing interest of his ever since and it was one of the seven quests. <laughs> Quest And I think there is a book also by uh, Sudarshan and Duff. Duke, I think. Not Duke. Duff. Yeah, Duff. Duff. That's Swin Statistics book by Duff. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is that right? Well, then, the yeah, yeah. But what is the co-author's name? Duke. 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 Uh, duck, 
Duck. Duck. Ah, not Duke. Uh, I said duff. I should have said duck. <laughs> okay, okay. It is duck. Yeah. Duck. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's very nice. It's a nice coincidence you have it in your bag. Do you sleep with it under your pillow? <laughs> huh? Beside. Okay. Under the pillow you will get a crick neck. Now I want to introduce very briefly the concept of multi-spin spinors with respect to SU2 just as a kind of uh, cousin brother to Cartesian tensors in the case of SO3. It is very similar in spirit. I will use Greek indices, alpha, beta and so on to go over two values, 1 and 2. These are going to be the labels for the components of a two component spinner. What is a two component spinner? Something which transforms according to the defining representation of SU2. So, now we say a rank J SU2 multi spinner. We define, we invent such an object. We say it is a collection of complex quantities which I write in this way. Sorry, oh, I have made some mistake. What am I? I think there are some errors in my. Uh, I have written here rank 2j. Why I don't remember now? Oh, yeah, j cannot be half integer. <laughs> You can't have a half, you can, can't have a rank half <laughs> multi spinner. For, see, j goes over the values 0, half, 1, 3 by 2, 2, and so on. So, 2j is always an integer. So, I am not as uh, careless as I momentarily thought. <laughs> a multi spinner of rank 2j is a collection of comp let us say for simplicity complex amplitudes or numbers psi alpha 1 alpha 2 up to alpha 2 j where every one of the indices goes over the two values 1 and 2 like a two component spinner and the transformation rule under an element of SU2 is the following. So, it is obvious that this is a consistent definition. You can apply SU2 elements one after the other, they will compose properly because you are just using the matrices of the defining representation again and again. So, this is the definition of an SU2 multi spinner, and this is to be thought of as the analog for SU2 of Cartesian tensors for SO3. But there are naturally important differences. How many components are there in general? For a multi spinor of rank 2J? Huh? Pardon? I can't hear you. 4 J squared. Why? Yeah, and how many indices? Yeah. <laughs> that is the number of components of a general rank 2j multi spinner. Now, we do the same game, play the same game as we did with Cartesian tensors. Since it is the same matrix appearing again and again, if this original psi had any kind of symmetry property under permutations of its subscripts, that symmetry property would be preserved. Psi prime would enjoy the same properties as psi. So, now we will say the following. Suppose you imagine 
that the original components are completely symmetric under all permutations of the indices then since it's the same u again and again this is also completely symmetric so symmetric multi spinors remain symmetric multi spinors now the counting is extremely simple how many components does a symmetric multi spinor have but see every index has only how many values one or two so the value of psi is completely determined if i tell you how many of these indices have the value one the rest must all be two there is not even a one two and three as we had in so3 so for a symmetric multi spinor how many inde algebraically independent components are there you just have to see how many of the indices could be one and in how many ways can i choose the value one the balance will have to be two tell me what's the number of components independent components huh no <laughs> how many of the component betas or alphas could take the value one how many could take the value one maybe none of them takes the value one all of them are two maybe one of them takes the value one the rest are two and what's the end all of them are one two j plus one so once you have a symmetric multi spinor the number of independent algebraically independent components is 2j plus one. there is no need to remove traces you already have hit rock bottom these are the irreducible representations of su2 so elementary okay now this idea or oh, one uh, passing remark that i have heard from sudarshan many many times that uh, schwinger in all his work he loved this multi spinor idea and in the context of uh, lorentz group four component spinors so everything he would write as far as possible in the language of multi spinors so i think that is why sudarshan also liked it very much now this fact that a symmetric multi spinor is already irreducible that it transforms according to an irreducible representation of su that is at the heart of a very important construction which i will now describe and this is used in so many ways but i'll just give you the group theoretical construction there are three names associated with this uh, uh, construction and i'll give you all of them weil jordan and schwinger so this is a way to very simply build up all the irreducible representations of su2 first i will give it in the original while form and then in the jordan schwinger form because that uses the mathematical machinery of quantum mechanics so what we say is suppose you have a matrix in the defining representation of su2 and you imagine a two component complex column vector with components psi and eta which transforms by this rule under an su3 su2 transformation so this is a linear homogeneous transformation now i think even the notation is exactly as it is in uh, herman weil's book group the theory of groups and quantum mechanics then the statement is the following now you take any j value 
0, half, 1, 3 by 2, any j you like and consider the monomials psi to the j plus m eta to the j minus m over square root of j plus m factorial j minus m factorial. You keep j fixed and you give for m all the standard values j, j minus 1, j minus 2 up to minus j. How many monomials do you have? <laughs> 2j plus 1, that's the number of m values. So I can write here 2j plus 1 monomials. Now, supposing you make psi and eta transform to psi prime and eta prime by this 2 by 2 defining matrix from the SU2. What will happen to these monomials? This is linear homogeneous. These monomials, since j is fixed, have total degree 2j. Just the m keeps changing from one monomial to the next. By homogeneity, psi prime j plus m, eta prime j minus m over this numerical factor must be must be a certain linear combination of the similar monomials formed out of psi and eta. Right? Because 2j total order cannot change the homogeneous transformation. All that can happen is that some coefficients will appear here and what will they depend upon? Hmm? U, the SU2. Well, <laughs> we are home. Simon, is it M prime M or M M prime? I have to <laughs> check my notes. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, if you don't mind, for the on the board it is much simpler. Let us have primes everywhere together and no primes together. This is the formula. So, this, this is the Hermann Weyl construction. It tells you these are the d functions of SU2. <laughs> so elementary. We have not used the uh, machinery of quantum theory of angular momentum. We have got the d matrices directly. Because it works very simply because SU2 is such a nice little group. So what is the range of uh, m? It is minus j to plus j in uh, unit steps. So this is the Weyl construction and it says that you get all the representations of SU2, all the irreducible representations are obtained by this construction. This same idea has been expressed in an operator language by Jordan and Schwinger. And the uh, original, the paper of Schwinger, it is not published paper, it is called an uh, NYO report. It's a report written for the US Atomic Energy Commission when in the 1950s or something. It is reprinted in many places. Uh, one of them, Schwinger's collected works published by uh, World Scientific. It is called, it's called, I think the, uh, the title of the collection is a quantum legacy. This is a collection of a few of the important articles of Schwinger published by World Scientific and I think this angular momentum, uh, this report, this long paper of his is included there. And the title of this uh,
manuscript by Schwinger is just, I think, on angular momentum, that's if I remember. So the idea is actually very elegant and this is used by many people in a variety of contexts. I want to emphasize, it is really this construction which is purely a C number construction, no operators, no ket vectors, nothing of the kind. But they have expressed it in this operator language which is convenient for various purposes. What you do is you introduce two independent harmonic oscillators, label them as A1 and A2 and impose the standard commutation relations among A's and A daggers. So this is equation 99. I am close to hitting a century unless you bowl me out at this point. <laughs> so you have to think of the two annihilation operators as arranged in a column vector and then the natural notation would be to say a dagger stands for the two creation operators arranged in a row vector. So in this jordan schwinger construction, it is based on the quantum mechanics of two independent harmonic oscillators. And now what do you do? What you do is out of these A's and A daggers, you define J1, J2 and J3 as operators, these are equal to one half A dagger Pauli matrix. This is the, called the Schwinger construction or Jordan Schwinger construction. I have not read uh, Jordan's original paper, I have read it's not accessible, maybe in German, I don't know. The Schwinger one, as I said, is reprinted in more than one place. What you now find is the following. You start with these harmonic oscillator commutation relations. The J's are bilinear, 1A and 1A dagger. For example, what is J3? The component is, uh, which is the only one that can be measured. <laughs> what is J3 in this construction? One half, one half of, pardon? Yeah, yeah, so in terms of the individual oscillators, what is J3? One half of something, what is that something? It's a number operator of oscillator 1 minus the number operator of oscillator 2 and one half of that. Now, how many J's are there? There are three of them. Are they Hermitian? Pauli matrices are Hermitian. I should stop for a moment. Finish. They are Hermitian and you can, you must do this. Must check that they obey the commutation relations of, SU, of the SU2 algebra as well, same as the SO3 algebra. So you see you have produced an angular momentum out of harmonic oscillators. This means that with these generators by exponentiating them, you are guaranteed that you will get a unitary representation of SU2. You are guaranteed because remember we do not have to impose any further conditions in the case of SU2 because it is simply connected. So now what happens is that here is a representation of SU2, it is unitary. What is its dimension? Tricky question. <laughs> what is the dimension of the space on which A's and A daggers are defined? Huh? Infinite dimension. Each oscillator has infinitely many states and this is product of the two of them. One Hilbert space for A1, A1 dagger, another for A2, A2 dagger, tensor product. 
So, what is the dimension of the unitary representation of SU2 which I get by exponentiating this j? Infinite. Now you ask, what irreducible representations does it contain? It is unitary, it is infinite dimensional, therefore it must be reducible. Because remember, one of the things I have said about SU2 representations is, every irreducible representation is finite dimension. So, this must be the direct sum of many irreducible representations. What does it contain? It contains every irreducible representation exactly once. And how do you see this? This is the uh, convenience of this construction. In the Hilbert space of the two, when I complete writing what I am writing, you will see very familiar things. You put the oscillator number 1 in its j plus mth quantum state. You put oscillator number 2 in the j minus mth quantum number state. Now, j may be integer or half integer, but whenever j is integer, m is integer. Whenever j is half integer, m is half integer. So, both j plus m and j minus m are always integers. So, they are the number operator for the two oscillators. And where do these things come from? Have you studied the uh, quantum theory of the harmonic oscillator in this operator language with A's and A daggers? You have. Why are these things here? This in the numer denominator, the square root of factorial. Normalization, Normalization factor. Have we not seen this just a few <laughs> minutes ago? <laughs> While construction. Same numerical factors. Why did he put them in? So that the matrices which come out are unitary. Okay. So, this is a very clever construction of the same old while uh, way of getting all the representation of SU2 in a language which he did not use, but which uh, Schwinger introduced in a very systematic way in 1951 or whenever that report was written. And uh, it is called the Jordan Schwinger construction. And what I can finally say is suppose we use axis angle variables, which is not very convenient for dematrices, but does not matter. In the language of quantum mechanics, we can say the set of 2j plus 1 oscillator states, j fixed and m going over the usual values, forms a basis for the jth irreducible representation of SU2. So, this construction gives you all the representations of SU2, nothing is uh, missing. And more importantly, every representation, irreducible representation of SU2 occurs once, only once. This is to be contrasted to the regular representation of SU2. What happens there? the jth irreducible representation will appear 2j plus 1 times. Each representation occurs in the regular representation as often as its dimension. So, from that point of view, you can say this is a very uh, uh, lean or economical way of constructing the representation of SU2. We have done some work in this uh, area trying to generalize this what did we generalize to? Any group, is it? I have forgotten now. I don't remember now. What did we do it for? We tried to generalize to as many groups as possible. <laughs> yeah, that is right. Then, after we did it, we found, of course, the Russians had done it long before, Gelfand and company. So, the idea that there should, that given any group, let us try to construct and uh, play with the representation of it which contains all the irreducible representations, but uh, only once each. That idea is there already in mathematics literature. They call it a model representation. That is what we learnt after we did this work. So, uh, that is in the papers of Gelfand and company, I do not remember 60s or 50s or 
some such thing. Not very recent. Oh no, I don't know, maybe recent, 70s. Anyway, we have given it the name Schwinger representation in honor of Schwinger because in the physics literature, this whole technique is uh, named after Schwinger. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess so, but uh, in a fit. How would you get it? Because you was a fit here itself. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Probably, that's the way he wrote yeah. itself. Just remove the angular momentum part. Just the orbital part. Orbital part. Orbital. Correct. That is true. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, that I have to introduce the whole idea of coherent states. I think it is going too far afield. Let me stop at this point. I want to terminate my description of SU2 and SO3 at this point. I have tried to give you a survey of this thing, uh, these two groups, the, what their representations look like, how the groups are related, how the representations are related. Uh, for some of you students, not everything might have been clear, but if you have taken down some notes, I feel that uh, later years, if you continue studying and doing work in physics, you may find this material uh, quite useful. Yeah. Yeah. The way of it. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's done by Dave because Dave was a student. Oh, in the textbook? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Textbook. Oh, that's. Only the figure. Oh, okay. Okay, fine. So that's a good uh, source. Yeah, I would like to add a comment. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not as profound as. Uh, no, don't do my thing. No, it's very, but nothing more, 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 yeah, and two more go in and two more come out, yeah. the beam splitter does not uh, absorb photons, so the number of total number of photons coming out is the same as the total number of photons going in. So if you want to describe beam splitter within quantum mechanics, then the equation that you wrote on the right hand side, it will be the full discrete. Fully. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I think that's a more uh, simpler, hmm. uh, more reachable situation. Yeah. This will be a lot, because most of these students yeah, yeah. come with the particular physics degree. So yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Just to give an indication of the variety of physical situations where the Schwinger construction is used, uh, there are. There's a, very beautiful paper by Robert R. H. Dickey introducing a concept called super radiance and that uses this construction. Then a few years ago there was a paper by Berry and Robbins, a new proof of the spin statistics theorem. Uh, it's not a very simple paper, it's not elegant, I, I, have, I didn't find it very uh, transparent, but there they have used this uh, Schwinger construction and I have heard Berry give a lecture on it and <laughs> he seems to have suddenly discovered that there is this, there is this sugar construction and he was singing great praises of it. But Berry is consistent. Uh, he, he never recognizes that people lived before him, <laughs> yeah. people lived after Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you are right. I think at some stage even a gifted person should reach a way of op functioning and uh, conducting himself where you uh, encourage others. At some age that has to come, <laughs> if it doesn't, I don't know. So I have completed two of the eight sections of this course and I will just start this third section and I uh, want to make it clear this is a fairly demanding subject. 
I also want to say that uh, I, I will be treating it in the way I learnt it from Professor Bargman, Valentine Bargman. Uh, many of you younger people may not know, in the 1930s, late 30s, he was an assistant to Einstein in the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Another assistant to Einstein in that period was Peter Bergman, B-E-R-G-M-A-N. -N. Bergman is the one who has written that beautiful Dover book on a Introduction to Relativity, both special and general, very beautiful book. Bargman was also a uh, Einstein assistant and he was much more mathematically inclined. So his greatest contribution, so he was really a mathematical physicist par excellence. Uh, and he worked, apart from working with Einstein later, he worked quite closely with Wigner and there are famous wave equations called the Bargman-Wigner equations. They are not much used in uh, practice. Uh, but they are very beautiful structure. So my treatment of this subject is taken from lectures and notes which I took at, uh, of Bergman in the year 1964-65. It was my great good fortune. I spent that year and in Princeton and he was going to teach. So every lecture I attended, uh, when I unavoidably miss one or two lectures, I made sure that I could get the material from another person and it happened to be S.M. Roy, who many of you know. He was a graduate student there at that time. So, <clears throat> the other thing is, my impression is that there is a course titled Lee Groups being given here now by Professor S. Ramanan. I, I, I think I saw a notice uh, two weeks ago. So, uh, this will be a very simple-minded approach. It will be something so that we know how to uh, do small calculations with it, get some concepts clear, but it is n there is no pretense to being uh, you know, elegant, complete and all these things. But for those who don't know anything, this will just be the first step. So, the opening comments I want to make are the following. That we have uh, gone through this representation, the description of these two groups, SO3 and SU2, in fair amount of detail. And I have said many things as we went along, as examples of things which we will now see in a greater uh, generality. So, we are now familiar with the following things. If you have a continuous group, it means that you can label the elements of the group by certain real coordinates, independent, continuously varying co coordinates or parameters of the group. We know that if you take two elements of a group, each one having certain coordinates, and you apply the group composition law, the product element will have some coordinates. They will be functions of the original sets of coordinates. We have seen in uh, SO3 and SU2 that in a representation of a continuous group, we have generators, we have commutation relations. We have structure constants, we have typically exponentials of generators as representing elements of the group. All of this will appear now in a very uh, expanded framework. And, uh, it's extremely beautiful. Ex uh, uh, everything which I will cover is also there in this uh, textbook which Sudarshan and I have written in um, classical mechanics, classical dynamics. So, uh, it will, this section <laughs> is a little bit long, it is fairly demanding. So, from now on I will not apologize anymore. So, I, uh, I will just make the following uh, general definitions now and then stop for today. How do you arrive at the concept of a Lie group? This thing I don't know too well. I have just a, what is it called, a layman's understanding or an engineering approach to these things. I'll tell you later a very beautiful book which describes all these things. 
you start with the concept of what is called a topological group. What is a topological group? It is a mathematical object which is a topological space which is also a group and the group operations are continuous. What does all this mean? A topological space is a mathematical concept of a space in which the idea of continuity can be defined in a satisfactory manner. So, making a space, a set into a topological space is with the intention of defining what you mean by continuous. So, continuity is the basic idea in topology. A topological group is a mathematical object in which concept of continuity is defined. It is also a group which means a composition law is defined and now you want to make these two things fit together. You want the procedure of composing two group elements to have continuity. You want the procedure of taking an element and passing to its inverse to have continuity. So, these two should be continuous operations. So, such a space, such a group is called a topological group. Now, what is a Lie group? It is a particular case of a topological group. A Lie group is a very special kind of topological group I will write it and then try to motivate it. A Lie group is a topological group that is a group in which continuity is defined, group operations are defined and group operations are continuous. You will call a topological group a Lie group if in some neighborhood of the identity the group looks like a little piece of Euclidean n-dimensional space for some n. Okay. Locally means in some neighborhood of the identity. Homeomorphic means it must look like n-dimensional Euclidean space a portion of that, some neighborhood of the origin in n-dimensional Euclidean space. So, from our uh, simple-minded point of view, what does it mean? A Lie group is a group in which group operations are continuous plus it is possible to describe group elements in some region around the identity by some number of real independent coordinates. That is all. Okay. So, topological group is a much wider notion. Uh, Lie group is this. So, it means that <coughs> we can uh, introduce coordinates into a Lie group. So, what is it that we will study in this chapter? I, will, I am not able to start the discussion, but we will just motivate it. What we will do is, we will study Lie groups in some amount of detail. Then we will see how from the concept of a Lie group, one arrives at a concept of a Lie algebra. It's a new concept. And then we will look at various properties of these things. And towards the end of this section, we will see how it may be possible given a Lie algebra to reconstruct the Lie group. So, we have to analyze Lie group concept, create a Lie algebra concept, see how to go from Lie group to Lie algebra and later try to see whether from Lie algebra we can come back to Lie group. Lie algebra basically is the structure of commutation relations like angular momentum commutation relations. And so, the is can the 
as we have seen for SO3 and SU2, if the commutation relations are satisfied, by exponentiation we get a, exponentiation we get a group representation. So, there is some procedure by which from the Lie algebra we should be able to work our way back to the group itself. But in this process, there are sure to be global problems. We have seen this for SO3, for SU2 it is not there. So, this is the agenda for this uh, section and I will start tomorrow. There is a uh, beautiful book. I say it is beautiful because I own a copy which I bought on a trip to uh, <laughs> New York City in 1961 in Barnes & Noble or somewhere. It is called Topological Groups by Pontryagin. And it is uh, original in Russian and translated into uh, English and uh, published by Princeton University Press. So, I bought the original first edition of this book. It is about uh, maybe 300 pages or so. So beautifully written. As I told you yesterday, Russian book, Soviet books in mathematics and mathematical physics, nobody else seems to have matched their uh, expository skills. A few years later, uh, a second edition of this book has appeared and that I think is uh, volume 1 and volume 2. That I am not familiar with. This one I bought, I have it, paperback copy and I will not part with it for love or for money. <laughs> Such a beautiful book. So many things described so beautifully there. And did you know that he was one of the great mathematicians and he was uh, blind? And I think his mother educated him. And it's incredible when you remember, realize he was blind and look at the text of everything. How can he? <laughs> it's just incredible that he could carry all these uh, mathematical ideas, calculations in the mind like that. Just in, impossible to imagine. So I like this book very much. I'm sure there are many other books, but this is the one I like. So I'll stop at this point. we come come back to it tomorrow. Same numerical factors. Why did he put them in? So that the matrices which come out are unitary. Okay. So, this is a very clever construction of the same old while uh, way of getting all the representation of SU2 in a language which he did not use, but which uh, Schwinger introduced in a very systematic way in 1951 or whenever that report was written. And uh, it is called the Jordan Schwinger construction. And what I can finally say is suppose we use axis angle variables, which is not very convenient for D matrices, but doesn't matter. In the language of quantum mechanics, we can say the set of 2j plus 1 oscillator states j fixed and m going over the usual values forms a basis for the jth irreducible representation of SU2. So, this construction gives you all the representations of SU2, nothing is uh, missing. And more importantly, every representation, irreducible representation of SU2 occurs once, only once. This is to be contrasted to the regular representation of SU2. What happens there? The jth irreducible representation will appear 2j plus 1 times. Each representation occurs in the regular representation as often as its dimension. So, from that point of view, you can say this is a very uh, uh, lean or economical way of constructing the representation of SU2. We have done some work in this uh, area, trying to generalize this. What did we generalize to? Any group, is it? Uh, I have forgotten <laughs> now. I don't remember now. What did we do it for? We, we tried to generalize to as many groups as, as, many groups as possible. <laughs> yeah, that is right. Then, after we did it, we found 
Of course, the Russians had done it long before, Gelfand and company. So, the idea that there should, that given any group, let us try to construct and uh, play with a representation of it, which contains all the irreducible representations, but uh, only once each. That idea is there already in mathematics literature. They call it a model representation. That's what we learnt after we did this work. So, uh, that is in the papers of Gelfand and company. I don't remember, 60s or 50s or some such thing. Not very recent. Oh no, I don't know, maybe recent, 70s. Anyway, we have given it the name Schwinger representation in honor of Schwinger because in the physics literature, this whole technique is uh, named after Schwinger. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess so, but uh, in but a fit. How do you get it? Because you give us a vision. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Probably that's the way he wrote yeah. itself. Sure. Just uh, remove the angular momentum part. Just uh, orbital part. Orbital part. Orbital part. Uh, Correct. That is true. Sure. Another one is that you would like to make a comment on. Yeah. Which has done so much, you can make a comment on the spin board. Yeah. <laughs> no, that uh, I have to introduce the whole idea of coherent states. I think it is going too far afield. Let me stop at this point. I want to terminate my description of SU2 and SO3 at this point. I have tried to give you a survey of this thing, uh, these two groups, the, what their representations look like, how the groups are related, how the representations are related. Uh, for some of you students, not everything might have been clear, but if you have taken down some notes, I feel that uh, later years, if you continue studying and doing work in physics, you may find this material uh, quite useful. Yeah. 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 So that's a good uh, source. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. It's not as profound as. Not on the Just to give an indication of the variety of physical situations where the Schwinger construction is used, uh, there are there is a very beautiful paper by Robert R. H. Dickey introducing a concept called super radiance, and that uses this construction. Then a few years ago, there was a paper by Berry and Robbins, a new proof of the spin statistics theorem. Uh, it's not a very simple paper, it's not elegant, I, I, I didn't find it very uh, transparent, but there they have used this uh, Schwinger construction and I have heard Berry give a lecture on it and <laughs> he seemed to have suddenly discovered that there, this, there is this Schwinger construction and he was singing great praises of it. But Berry is consistent, he never recognizes that people lived before him, <laughs> yeah. people lived after him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you are right. I think at some stage even a gifted person should reach a way of op functioning and uh, conducting himself where you uh, encourage others. 
at some age that has to come. If he doesn't, I don't know. So I have completed two of the eight sections of this course and I will just start this third section and I uh, want to make it clear this is a fairly demanding subject. I also want to say that uh, I, I will be treating it in the way I learnt it from Professor Bargman, Valentine Bargman. Uh, many of you younger people may not know, in the 1930s, late 30s, he was an assistant to Einstein in the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Another assistant to Einstein in that period was Peter Bergman, B-E-R-G-M-A-N-N. -N. Bergman is the one who has written that beautiful Dover book on an introduction to relativity, both special and general, very beautiful book. Bergman was also a uh, Einstein assistant and he was much more mathematically inclined. So his greatest contribution, so he was really a mathematical physicist par excellence. Uh, and he worked, apart from working with Einstein later, he worked quite closely with Wigner and there are famous wave equations called the Bargman-Wigner equations. They are not much used in uh, practice, uh, but they are very beautiful structure. So my treatment of this subject is taken from lectures and notes which I took at, uh, of Bargman in the year 19... Uh, 64-65. It was my great good fortune. I spent that year and in Princeton and he was going to teach. So every lecture I attended, when I unavoidably missed one or two lectures, I made sure that I could get the material from another person and it happened to be S. M. Roy, who many of you know. He was a graduate student there at that time. So, <coughs> other thing is, my impression is that there is a course titled Lee Groups being given here now by Professor S. Ramanan. I, I, I think I saw a notice uh, two weeks ago. So, uh, this will be a very simple minded approach. It will be something so that we know how to uh, do small calculations with it, get some concepts clear, but it is n there is no pretense to being uh, you know, elegant, complete, and all these things. But for those who don't know anything, this will just be the first step. So, the opening comments I want to make are the following. That we have uh, gone through this representation, the description of these two groups, SO3 and SU2, in fair amount of detail. And I have said many things as we went along as examples of things which we will now see in a greater uh, generality. So we are now familiar with the following things. If you have a continuous group, it means that you can label the elements of the group by certain real coordinates, independent, continuously varying co coordinates or parameters of the group. We know that if you take two elements of a group, each one having certain coordinates and you apply the group composition law, the product element will have some coordinates. They will be functions of the original sets of coordinates. We have seen in uh, SO3 and SU2 that in a representation of a continuous group, we have generators, we have commutation relations. We have structure constants, we have typically exponentials of generators as representing elements of the group. All of this will appear now in a very uh, expanded framework and uh, it's extremely beautiful. Ex uh, uh, everything which I will cover is also there in this uh, textbook which Sudarshan and I have written in um, classical mechanics, classical dynamics. So. Uh, 
it will this section <laughs> is a little bit long it is fairly demanding so from now on i will not apologize anymore so i uh, i will just make the following uh, general definitions now and then stop for today how do you arrive at the concept of a lead group this thing i don't know too well i have just a what is it called a layman's understanding or an engineering approach to this thing i'll tell you later a very beautiful book which describes all these things you start with the concept of what is called a topological group what is a topological group it is a mathematical object which is a topological space which is also a group and the group operations are continuous what does all this mean a topological space is a mathematical concept of a space in which the idea of continuity can be defined in a satisfactory manner so making a space a set into a topological space is with the intention of defining what you mean by continuous so continuity is the basic idea in topology a topological group is a mathematical object in which concept of continuity is defined it is also a group which means the composition law is defined and now you want to make these two things fit together you want the procedure of composing two group elements to have continuity you want the procedure of taking an element and passing to its inverse to have continuity so these two should be continuous operations so such a space such a group is called a topological group now what is a lie group it is a particular case of a topological group a lie group is a very special kind of topological group i will write it and then try to motivate it a lie group is a topological group that is a group in which continuity is defined group operations are defined and group operations are continuous you will call a topological group a lie group if in some neighborhood of the identity the group looks like a little piece of euclidean n dimensional space for some n okay locally means in some neighborhood of the identity homeomorphic means it must look like n dimensional euclidean space a portion of that some neighborhood of the origin in n dimensional euclidean space so from our uh, simple minded point of view what does it mean a lie group is a group in which group operations are continuous plus it is possible to describe group elements in some region around the identity by some number of real independent coordinates that is all okay so topological group is a much wider notion uh, lie group is this so it means that <coughs> we can uh, introduce coordinates into a lie group so what is it that we will study in this chapter i will, i am not able to start the discussion but will just motivate it what we will do is we will study lie groups in some amount of detail then we will see how from the concept of a lie group one arrives at a concept of a lie algebra it's a new concept and then we will look at various properties of these things and towards the end of this section we will see how it may be possible 
given a Lie algebra to reconstruct the Lie group. So we have to analyze Lie group concept, create a Lie algebra concept, see how to go from Lie group to Lie algebra and later try to see whether from Lie algebra we can come back to Lie group. Lie algebra basically is the structure of commutation relations like angular momentum commutation relations. And so the question is can the as we have seen for SO3 and SU2 if the commutation relations are satisfied by exponential we get a exponentiation we get a group representation. So there is some procedure by which from the Lie algebra we should be able to work our way back to the group itself. But in this process there are sure to be global problems. We have seen this for SO3, for SU2 it is not there. So this is the agenda for this uh, section and I will start tomorrow. There is a uh, beautiful book. I say it is beautiful because I own a copy which I bought on a trip to uh, <laughs> New York City in 1961 in Barnes & Noble or somewhere. It is called Topological Groups by Pontryagin. And it is uh, original in Russian and translated into uh, English and uh, published by Princeton University Press. So I bought the original first edition of this book. It is about uh, maybe 300 pages or so. So beautifully written. As I told you yesterday, Russian book, Soviet books in mathematics and mathematical physics, nobody else seems to have matched their uh, expository skills. A few years later, uh, a second edition of this book has appeared and that I think is uh, volume 1 and volume 2. That I am not familiar with. This one I bought, I have it, paperback copy and I will not part with it for love or for money. <laughs> Such a beautiful book. So many things described so beautifully there. And did you know that he was one of the great mathematicians and he was uh, blind? And I think his mother educated him. And it's incredible when you remember, realize he was blind and look at the text of everything. How can he? <laughs> it's just incredible that he could carry all these uh, mathematical ideas, calculations in the mind like that, just in, impossible to imagine. So I like this book very much. I'm sure there are many other books, but this is the one I like. So I'll stop at this point. We come, come back to it tomorrow.